Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay. Sorry, you missed my wonderful introduction. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't mind people. Yeah. Okay. Essentially, we were thanking everyone for being here and showing interest in this project, which uh, we are introducing here, but not for the first time. We have already presented a, a paper about it at the American Political Science Association in Montreal in September. We also received uh, feedback on it from colleagues at Queen's University, our, our home uh, institution. And uh, we will be, we will continue to <laughs> talk about it. Some of you have already heard about it in different uh, um, venues. And because, because it is conceived, it is meant to be work in progress. That's the idea behind, behind the database. And um, so I will begin by briefly telling you a little bit about the motivation behind the project and um, a little bit about the main concepts and uh, the research behind it. And then I will hand it over to Olga uh, to present the database itself. And what's new today is that we are also hoping to show you uh, the website that we have constructed for this database. So why we need a comparative minority centered database, comparative minority centered knowledge. And I know I don't have to belabor this point to this audience that for anyone interested in democracy, in the health of democracy, uh, at any time, but especially at a time like this, when there is a lot of nationalism and conflict going on, uh, polarization, political polarization in societies, and um, institutions are becoming, showing all kinds of, democratic institutions are showing all kinds of weakness, and there is a considerable amount of concern about social resilience, society's resilience to state capture, autocratization, polarization, all of that. And at a time like this, we are almost going out on a limb <laughs> talking about minorities and the need for a minority-centered uh, comparative database that focuses on the associational life of minorities. And the reason we are doing this is precisely because there is less uh, attention, even among people who recognize the need for uh, associational, for knowledge about the associational life in societies. There is tons of literature, evidence in comparative politics, scholarship literature, about the need for social resilience through associational life. Uh, associational life that means not only political organizations and advocacy groups, but also schools and uh, churches and temples and mosques and theaters and, um, and sports clubs and all of that, that in the social capital literature and civil society literature, is, is, is usually talked about in terms of social capital. And many of you know about the work of uh, Robert Putnam, who, for example, talked about, has been talking about this for a long time and also spoke about the need in this meso level associational life for organizations to do both bonding and bridging. Bonding, especially for cultures to persist, and bridging so that uh, minority cultures do not become, or anything that's a special culture, that's not the mainstream, for it not to become marginalized, segregated, alienated, and then possibly turn against the state in ways that are not predictable. And so there is knowledge and there is an expectation about the work of, of associations generally we also know from, from empirical literature and comparative studies that it's not the existence of organizations that really matters, but what they do, 
because for example, in Weimar Germany, there were plenty of organizations, associations, but they weren't doing the, the work of democracy. So that we know that there is need for comparative knowledge. There is less attention, really very little scarce uh, comparative knowledge about what minorities do in the associational life. And this is despite concerns about democracy, despite an understanding that all states have minorities. And this is not an issue that is going to go away. There are persistent minorities, traditional minorities, uh, newcomer groups who are interested, who congregate in, in large metropolitan areas or, uh, or you know, come across the border due to natural disasters, uh, climate crisis, all kinds of reasons. And in a conflict prone world, there is need for us to pay attention to these persistent minorities that are not going to assimilate to a mainstream culture from one day to the next. They may not want to do that. They may not be able to do that. Sometimes the mainstream culture doesn't want them in. And so ethnicity, you know, culture is ethnicity and ethnicity is in many, many cases, not something that people choose, <laughs> they're born into it and they're thrown into all kinds of situations. And so persistent minorities continue to exist in states. In states that are still pursuing, state centers are going to continue to pursue majoritarian state building, nation building. A nation building essentially in a simplified way means an effort to create comfortable majorities, an effort to create a comfortable majority in a state that makes the state governable, that makes people feel that they belong to a common shared story that makes them invested. And in an ideal world, this is a good thing. It, it can happen. If you look at the world, it's not an ideal world. And if you look at the map of, you know, political map of the world, there are many regions of the world where comfortable majorities have not been created, Africa and other regions of the world. And so even if this is a project that in a neutral sense would be a good thing, ideally it would be great if all political borders coincided with uh, cultural borders, that's not the world in which we live. And so, and this is not going away. And so persistent minorities are in the center of the attention in this database because we know very little about what makes, essentially what makes members of persistent minorities invested in democratic ways of pursuing their special interests. They are going to have special interests. Some of their interests are gonna be the same as those in the larger society, but some of their interests are going to be special to their culture. And so what makes people living in what I call the minority condition invested in pursuing their special interests democratically, as opposed to becoming alienated from the state, turning against the state, uh, going using other non-democratic, uh, violent or other methods. And so our pool of cases are essentially ordinary minority members who you saw the first ima image of, on this uh, slideshow, just go about their business where they live and they live their social lives where they live, which is sending their kids to school, maybe going to a religious institution or not, going to the theater, choosing a media outlet, and so on and so forth. And so that's the associational world, the meso level associational world that we are interested in. And we are coming from uh, a perspective that recognizes that members of persistent minorities look at the state, at the majoritarian nation building state from a different angle. They are structurally disadvantaged due to numbers. There are numbers. There is also always uncertainty. We are looking at states that do not guarantee institutions. 
people need time horizon in order to send their kids to a school, they need to know that the school is going to exist in five years. Um, and so persistent minority members look at the state from a different perspective because the majority of the mainstream or to use Harris Melonas' uh, concept, the core is going to always have institutions. So the fight among the mainstream and core people is not about whether there will be a school in their language or a theater in their language or media in their language, but what kind of school, what kind of media, what kind of theater. But for minority, persistent minority members, they always have to show that they are there in a significant enough number to be worthy of support and they are not a threat to the state. They constantly have to negotiate this. They constantly have to balance this. And, and so this situation is not well understood. There's a lot of literature on, on violent cases, on war, on, on you know, the threatening cases. But if you look at the world, most minority members are more ordinary people going about their business where they live. And they may want to assimilate, they may not. They may not be able to, they may not be wanted. They are persistent minorities. And for those of us interested in democracy, we know that everyone should have democratic agency, everyone, including also minority, persistent minority members. And so there is this other concept, minority democratic agency, um, which, which, which we are, showcasing here. So democratic agency in general terms essentially means access to decision making about rules by which people live. And so it has, and this is also in democracy literature, it has an individual dimension, which means uh, equal access, non-discrimination, all of that. But it always has a collective associational dimension. And this is part of democracy literature. And so this is the ability to sustain associational life according to the interests of people where they live. This is harder to achieve in a persistent minority condition. It's more costly because it is, it's a special thing. It's not what the state normally, the mainstream normally provides. It requires extra work, extra resources. Sometimes it's swimming as upstream and there is built-in securitization because from the majority nation building perspective, the logic of it, no matter who the actors are, the logic of it is that they want to create a comfortable majority. So if the minority becomes a threat to that, that's a threat. So there's built-in uncertainty, built-in insecurity. And so there's a securitization component. Minority, persistent minority actors constantly have to say, do not be afraid of us. We are worthy of support. We are still here. <laughs> and so there is built-in securitization, especially in cases where there is an activist kin state across the border. Like, for example, Russia now <laughs> in relation to Russian speakers in the Baltic states, not to mention Ukraine. And so um, this database, comparative minority institutions database, is based on this, uh, this rec you know, recognizing the need and, um, and recognizing common sense in democracy literature recognizing that there is really scarce knowledge, but there's a lot of suspicion. <laughs> and so we figured we are going to start putting in a lot of work and effort to develop a database, a minority institutions database, which we created as a flexible framework for knowledge sharing about minority access, participation, and agency. Olga will show you a little bit more about what that me those mean. Our core material is for the region we study, which is Central and Eastern Europe. And um, the scope is broader. We are confident that it can be improved, expanded, deepened. As I said, the intention of this is to be work in progress. 
And it's been supported primarily by a grant I had at the University of Graz for two years, so data collection. Um, a lot of the data collection comes from that, but we actually started working together on concepts and collecting material earlier, several years earlier. And um, I do want to say that we have at this point uh, quite a bit of data about nine minorities from the Baltics to the Balkans. And the database uh, website is being launched uh, with data on six minorities, Hungarians in Romania and Slovakia, Russian speakers in Estonia and Latvia, and Russian speakers and Poles in Lithuania. And this covers quite a few interesting cases that have activist kin states and minorities that some of them are have been there as historic traditional minorities for longer than others. <laughs> And uh, they already, as you will see, are showing us some interesting and also some counterintuitive findings. I'd like to acknowledge especially Tamash Kish's work, who is the third party who is with whom we have been developing this. He's um, a researcher, a sociologist at the Romanian Institute for Research on National Minorities in Cluj. And I also want to say that at least the names of the researchers who collected a lot of material locally, starting with Lithuania, Vilana Pilinkaitis Sotirovic and um, Karolis Dambrauskas about Poles and uh, Russian speakers in Lithuania, Ivan Polinian, uh, Russian speakers in Estonia, Kristina Kallas, Russian speakers in Latvia, Tomasz Kish, uh, Tibor Toro, Hungarians in Romania, Tunde Morvai, Hungarians in Slovakia, Reka Adios, uh, Hungarians in uh, Serbia, Ali uh, Husseinoglu, Turks in Bulgaria, Mila Baeva, also Turks in Bulgaria, Ognen Bangalov, uh, Albanians in North Macedonia. So those are the cases about which we have been collecting lots of original data as well. And um, we are presenting it with the six cases. We build on large bodies of literature. I'm not going to have time now to talk about that. I'm happy to come back to it later. And um, the novelty, just to highlight the novelty, that it's focused squarely on minorities, uh, that it, we are taking that seriously. We are involving minority researchers, not only minority researchers, because we are not essentialists. We don't think that only minority people can may speak about minorities, <laughs> nor that only majority speakers uh, may speak about majorities. But we want to include and really take this agency aspect seriously in the research. We focus on meso-level aspects primarily because there's a huge gap. There's some data, but huge gap in comparative. And we focus on nonviolent cases because there's a huge gap on ordinary minorities. Over to you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Georgia. It was actually a great presentation. Um, for <laughs> we like each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, useful too, but uh, I think it really sets the stage for kind of diving into what we do, what we have so far, uh, and understanding why it's important in, uh, for research, why it's important for real uh, life implications. So when we think of minority democratic agency, we think of three aspects of it uh, that relate to minorities' ability to access institutions that are important for their uh, quality of life. So we have, uh, and we conceive of these access, participation, and agency as hierarchically ordered uh, concepts, uh, such that minorities need first and foremost uh, an entry level sort of access to institutions to be able to use them. Uh, then the uh, participation refers to their actual presence in associations uh, and or membership uh, in associations, and agency speaks to their ability then to access decision making. So, and to uh, uh, utilize democratic agency. So access and participation thus form uh, prerequisites for minorities' ability to exercise any democratic agency. 
And as we develop the database, these are sort of at the core of our thinking of minority association life. And we can actually examine them at all levels. So we can think of minorities ability to access, participate, and uh, exercise agency at the individual level, uh, at the meso level of institutions, which is the focus of the database, but also at the macro level, right? Being able to access the very decisions that affect their lives. So the database uh, focuses on the micro or individual level of analysis and the meso, where meso or the association life is the heart of the database. Uh, and the idea is because, as Georgia said, uh, there's uh, a lot of comparative research on macro level um, uh, treatment of minorities. So think state structures and state policies affecting them. We also know quite a bit about minorities on individual level, uh, their political participation and representation and so on. So it is the meso level that we are seeking to address here. Uh, and the idea is because, as you said, and as the image on the brochure illustrates, that it's just normal people uh, living their daily lives uh, that engage in different types of uh, organizations, cultural, uh, educational, political, and others. And so what we're trying to understand is what kind of associations do they form and participate in, in which societal domains, so politics more so, or culture, or education, or maybe environment and sports, um, and how do they look, these associations? What can we say about them? So at the micro level of analysis, we have, uh, we look at the relative status of minorities and we look at common indicators of um, uh, economic uh, participation and education. In education, we look at parity in general education. So to see if there are ethnic gaps uh, in education between minorities and dominant groups and educational attainment through the proportion of university graduates from each group. And uh, labor market participation focuses on unemployment rates. Um, at the meso level uh, of analysis, we look at self-governing institutional capacity. So here are uh, ideas to innovate on what uh, already exists and add concepts and measures that help us better understand minority association life. And we uh, propose here associational density, structures of self-governance and organizational form. I will uh, introduce each one of them, define and give you sort of the snapshot of the data we have so far. And the second innovation is that we map uh, the database, all the minority associations across 12 uh, societal domains. So it's uh, quite a comprehensive uh, view of societal domains that again, ranges from education to uh, uh, economy, healthcare, uh, culture, environment, advocacy, politics, and so on. So not only the political domain, which we tend to focus on, but uh, again, as a minority-centered approach on minorities at large, and what it is that they do, and how do they vary from one to another. Um, Okay, so I'll uh, just illustrate the micro level um, parity in general education indicator we have so that we can spend most of the time, the remaining time, to uh, look at the database. So, in general education, we look at comparative PISA uh, test results. And PISA is the program for international student assessment. They uh, conduct, uh, they evaluate uh, general competencies of 15 year old students every three years in three categories, mathematics, reading, and sciences. And uh, so to uh, sort of uh, assess whether there are ethnic gaps, we uh, compare ethnic minorities in the language of the test that they took. So they can take it in the minority language, their mother tongue, or the dominant language in each case, where the majority students are a reference category. So you can see a flat line, horizontal line at the zero point difference, uh, where uh, that would be uh, uh, where there is no ethnic gaps between groups. If uh, a positive gap uh, indicates a, a gap in favor of dominant, of, sorry, of minorities, whereas a negative gap indicates that um, majorities outperform minorities. So in the Estonian and Slovakian case, we see that uh, one type of trend uh, in terms of uh, uh, disparities in general education. Regardless of the language of the test, mother tongue or dominant language, 
minorities perform worse so than uh, dominant groups. So we see that they're both below the line. In a black solid line, we see represented are the minorities who took the test in their mother tongue. So Russian for Russian speakers in Estonia and Latvia and Hungarian for Hungarians in Slovakia and Romania. And the dashed line represents the difference between minorities who took the test in the dominant language. But we also observe another type of gap, and that is within the minority community. And if you look at Latvia and even more so Romania, minorities who test in their mother tongue perform much better than minorities or their peers who do the test in the dominant language. In Latvia, there is almost no uh, as significant ethnic gap between uh, these minorities and the dominant groups. And in Romania, they actually outperform uh, members of the dominant groups. So just to put this in um, substantive terms, according to the OECD, a gap of 38 points is equivalent to one year of schooling. So these are average results across the years that we have uh, uh, in each of our cases across the three, three categories. So we can say that overall, with uh, a couple of exceptions, uh, there is a persistent gap between minorities and majorities so that is equivalent to one to even two years or a bit more than that in some cases on average. So not a fluke, not a one instance, but an average um, phenomenon. So we also have here data, uh, I will not get into this. We can also look at this. You can, you're welcome to check our website on educational attainment and labor market participation for uh, um, these, um, the cases that we, we want to uh, speak to so far. So on the website as well, we have a more complete data on these cases, but of course we want to expand and uh, present more data on other cases we've uh, collected data on. So when we switch to back to meso level of analysis here, we speak to self-governing institutional capacity of minorities. And that is again to understand what is it they do at the association level, what kind of organizations they uh, engage in. So first we look at associational density. And here the idea is that in majoritarian states, like Jojo was saying, minorities have primarily themselves to make sure that they have their minority language school, the cultural center, a theater, a newspaper, and so on. So having these organizations is important for their social capital to be able to address their needs and engage in collective action. So the idea here is to ask, okay, so what are the sheer numbers of these uh, associations and how do they, are they distributed across different domains? So we define association, associational density as the proportion of the number of minority organizations to 1000 members of minority communities. And um, so here we have uh, the minority population in each of our cases, the total number of organizations and the density. And we can already see that some exhibit much higher density than others. So uh, Hungarians in Slovakia have 8.5 organizations per 1,000 members of the minority community, but Russian speakers in Latvia have less than one per 1,000 members. But then of course, associational density just gives us the bird's eye view, right? The sheer numbers. And because we count each organization as one, regardless of whether it's a big one with uh, uh, lots of members uh, and maybe branches across the country, and, but also those that have only a handful of members, then it, it really illustrates just the numbers. So to get a better idea, we also uh, speak to the structures of these organizations. And this here is a, it's a ordinarily scaled um, uh, concept where we look at the minorities' uh, autonomy in the decision-making within those organizations. So it ranges from minority-governed organizations to majority-governed where they have no uh, self-governing uh, capacity. Minority-governed uh, associations are controlled by the minorities. Ethnic category, uh, such as language, their customs and traditions are the default within these uh, institutions. And they are really important for bonding, with creating bonding ties within the minority community and developing their social capital. Shared organizations uh, are not typically governed by minorities, but there's significant presence of minorities and uh, uh, ethnicity is recognized. So here an example is of a school where it's a designated minority language stream of instruction uh, within it. Multi-ethnic organizations are interested in that 
they are uh, they recognize ethnicity and actually are created to facilitate inter-ethnic cooperation. They build trust and they are uh, performing a bridging role across communities. So you can think of multi-ethnic uh, or multilingual political parties, churches, theaters, schools, and so on. And finally, major, majority governed associations are not governed by minorities. Ethnicity is not marked within these uh, associations, but we include them because they uh, have a significant minority presence within them. So minorities use these institutions, uh, but they have no uh, ability to uh, govern themselves within them. So here, a school that has significant minority presence of minority students, but the, their language is not language of instruction, administration, or anything like that. Um, actually, I would like to present uh, this data, if possible, through our website. So uh, this is the Minority Institutions Database. It's a work in progress, uh, but we have just launched it a few days ago. We're very proud of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of information here, of course, well beyond what we can present in this uh, PowerPoint. Um, so I'll just go and show you the structure of self-governance, uh, um, overall results. So we can already see that minority governed are the most dominant uh, type of minority organization. Uh, but there is a significant variation. Hungarians in Slovakia uh, have 95% of their organizations are minority governed, whereas for Poles in Lithuania, there is a near equal split between minority governed and shared organizations. So uh, that is quite interesting in itself. Multi-ethnic organizations are not numerous at all. But uh, we think of them as really important and really the only type of organization that facilitates inter-ethnic cooperation, does not replicate the ethnic hierarchy of the society at large, uh, but develops uh, bridges and develops inter-ethnic trust. It also prevents minority isolation. Um, so one caveat here, majority governed organizations is uh, the only category for which we have some missing data. And uh, for Hungarians in Romania, we have really good data, but for other cases, we have missing or uh, partial data. So of course, as more uh, data comes in, uh, these percentages uh, are likely to change somewhat, but uh, it doesn't affect the distribution within the, those organizations that have some, where minorities have some self-governing capacity, right? Minority governed, shared, and multi-ethnic. And um, we, we decided to keep majority governed uh, here and present them, even though we missed some data on that category, because again, it tells us something about the kind of the association lives of ethnic minorities. Um, and uh, it also allows us to speak uh, to them comparatively. And We also look at the same organizations uh, from an organizational form perspective. Are they nonprofits? Are they public? Are they for-profit organizations? So nonprofits, of course, are you know, the equivalent to a third sector, everything that is between the state and the market. And within public organizations, we decided to distinguish between central and local authority because uh, minorities build and develop their associations uh, where they live. Uh, and so knowing the local opportunities uh, and challenges is really important for uh, evaluating their uh, association life and for profit. And um, so for overall data, we can tell that uh, nonprofit is the most uh, common category uh, into which minority associations fall into. But even here, there is an interesting split where in some cases, uh, there is a near equal split between a nonprofit and uh, some kind of public organizations, uh, whether centrally or, or locally uh, controlled. For-profit the, is the least populated category, and we find that these are primarily in the media domain, that is newspapers, uh, TV channels, radio, and so on, which is another important uh, indicator of minority life, right? How they use these associations. Okay, so to conclude, um, the idea behind the database and this research project in general is uh, uh, to, to adopt a minority-centered uh, comparative approach 
to understand what it is that minorities do at the meso levels, uh, what kind of associations they uh, advance, uh, maintain, and participate in. And from uh, our uh, from exposing this work to uh, other scholars and minority actors, we know that it is needed. People would want to know how do other actors in similar circumstances uh, manage the, the, their structural disadvantages. Um, and our aim is to continue developing this uh, database so for to deepen it and add some additional aspects to better understand minority association life, but as well as maintaining it and uh, keep adding uh, data, but also expand it. So we have data on the Balkans, but because the framework is so flexible, it can uh, really be used to work for other minorities who are also positioned in structural disadvantages uh, and how do they uh, develop their democratic agency, how do they engage in associational life. So for that, of course, uh, there's a need for credible commitment and support uh, to keep this work, maintain it, but also expand it. Thank you so much for coming uh, on uh, via Zoom or in person, and I uh, would like to hear what you think about it so far. Yeah. Thanks so much. <clears throat> I hope uh, we were actually people online could actually listen to us. Hopefully, um, Matt, are you going to manage the online? Okay. So I will manage the questions here, and Matt will uh, will help us with online. So first question from the room first. <clears throat> it was very. Yeah, I would just so yeah. how would can you identify oh, yourself? I'm, sorry, I'm Ron Bookbinder, retired, just interested. <laughs> There's some books. Yeah. <laughs> oh my <laughs> uh, I'm curious, how would the database be used? Uh how would it advance the goals that you discussed? Can you take it? Yeah. Okay. Um that's a great question, right? Because the idea for it to not be just a, a paper, but actual database. So uh, the idea here is that it's open access to everyone and people would use it as any other database. We think that knowing these aspects of associational life of persistent minorities can spark interesting questions, right? So just by reviewing the data we have so far, one can think of why is there variation? Uh, why is it that some minorities uh, maintain uh, mostly self-governing institutions completely separate, whereas others may be split in them, having also shared organizations or even inter-ethnic organizations? So maybe someone can ask, what can you tell us about the minority-majority relations in each case, or maybe the... Um, uh, structures, uh, state structures and how they affect minorities. Maybe some are more limited and have just themselves to rely on, but others are provided with some state uh, assistance uh, or funds. So the, the idea is to present this data that would spark interesting questions. In our own paper that uh, sort of uh, presents the database, um, we uh, make a very, very short illustration of a use for the database where we ask, uh, given the, uh, Russia's uh, uh, involvement in Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, it has ripple effects toward other minorities, right? Russia is a very active um, kin state. And so how does that affect uh, minorities in the post-Soviet region? Uh, so what we look at is uh, why is it that Latvia and Estonia reacted in different ways toward Russian speakers already within this one year of war? And to better understand why they reacted the way they did in their different ways, uh, we, we use the database. We speak to their minorities association life uh, and differentiate between them uh, based on, uh, for example, why are they more active in the political domain or education domain and how that can uh, assist us in understanding uh, state reaction to them. So that is, uh, addressing a, a, a pertinent question that is relevant right now uh, um, regarding ethnic minorities, especially in this region. So volatile and always provides more thought. Uh, yeah. We have uh, one question online, but I'll first go to Jim Goldgaard. Great, thanks, Jim Goldgaard, former director of Iris. Great <laughs> for the opportunity. Um, so 
Yeah, I, your last answer um, on the work you're going to do based with this data, uh, I would love to hear more, partly because, so when you presented, for example, on Russians in Latvia, that seemed to be the group that where there were the least educational disparities, but you also showed, then you showed the associations and they seem to be, uh, they seem to have the highest score on mm -hmm. uh, educational attainment and the lowest score when you when you had the, when you showed the association. So I'm just curious. Beyond, I mean, it's great that you're presenting all this data for people to use. What a great service to the field. Um, but just in terms of your own work and your own thinking about the interrelationship between these these different factors, I was just curious what your what your thinking is. What other kinds of projects you're going to be doing? utilizing the data because that just jumped out at me when those two slides in a row they they suggested very different things so i was just curious the relationship right thank you jim so that's uh we think one of one of the values of having a database like this that a comparative one that it sparks questions like that that um seen like uh, that point to us the need for research mm -hmm. because you look at that and you say okay hold a minute does that make sense it probably does from some perspective but we have to find the answer and so we we are pursuing our own research but we are putting it out for other researchers to take a look and find those questions or help them see their own questions from a different perspective and one of the um, one of the questions that obviously is out there and is very significant and is triggered by all of this as well is uh, what happens when an activist kin state is not just activist in a in a softish kind of way but becomes an aggressor even if they are not attacking the home state of that particular minority population but the neighbor like Russia does in Ukraine the full invasion of Ukraine. And, um, and so uh, one of the things that the database can provide as, as more data can come in and we can continue developing it and deepening it is to look at, for example, sources of funding. Because uh, we have only listed the various types of funding, nonprofit, um, you know, state funding, whatever, but international funding is also important. And so minorities can become more vulnerable to a kin state if their institutional life, the time horizon that an institutional life can otherwise provide is not sustainable internally because they are not getting enough support from the state center. And they're looking, knocking on, on the door in the kin state center, they become more vulnerable, more dependent on external uh, sources. Their democratic agency weakens by that, right? So they are more vulnerable to the state center because they are becoming more suspicious for having those ties. They are more dependent on the kin state as well. So if we look at those differences in the way various types of organizations get funded, for example, that's going to help us understand some of that. And um, and so for moving forward, one of the things we are hoping to add, if we get you know commitment and resources is to fill in the, that information about funding, for example, and international networks. How autonomous organizations can be. We are looking at self-governing structure within organizations, but we are not yet able to, to see how dependent organizations are on other, you know, the state and other states. And so all of that information is, we think, going to provide the wealth of knowledge for those other bigger larger research questions i have a question from online i don't know i i will i think it's better if uh, you are mute them mm -hmm. ivan yeah we can hear you uh ivan polinin integration foundation of estonia uh, first of all uh thank you both very much for this presentation um my first question would most likely be where can we read more 
because for example my colleagues are extremely interested in the results and uh, moreover we are planning for um, the next integration conference in Estonia and uh, we would love to invite you there to present the findings especially that uh, to compare the Estonian case to the rest of the uh, Central and Eastern Europe is quite valid but the second question is more uh, concentrated on the method uh, as I remember the data collection stopped in the year 2020 so is this initiative a long term or do you plan to collect more data in the future or will it be just eventually abandoned because even the nature of those minority institutions uh, actually changed a lot due to the war in Ukraine and uh, something that was true three years ago might not be already and I'm speaking not only about Estonia here so thank you thank you I mean the website link by the way Matt uh, already shared it but I guess you mean more than that right yeah so we can so, just say something about this. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ivan. And, uh, and the rest of you can copy it up there. <laughs> uh, be, in, be in touch about that uh, integration conference. I've been to one of those. I was invited a few years ago to one of those, and it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. And would be happy to present the Estonian case in comparative perspective. And you're absolutely right. The research stopped in 2020. And I'm going to give it over to Olga to say more about yeah. what our intention is. So uh, with this kind of database, as you saw, um, if we just look at, you know, if you look at the data, uh, sorry, just, If you look at the total number, for example, of organizations in each case, you know, you know we, we have almost 10,000 in the Hungarian case. So uh, 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 updating this kind of database is very time consuming, but primarily costly. And Juja was uh, naming all the people who worked uh, for months and months on this project, collecting this data about each and every single association. So all the data we presented was self-governing capacity relates to each one of them, and also their organizational form, whether they're nonprofit or not, and links and um, some general information. So it's a really huge data set. You know, we present just a, sort of the, the final output of these beautiful, nice and neat tables, but actually there is so much uh, data behind all of that. So updating that is a huge, huge task. It is not meant to be uh, just a sort of a snapshot of you know reality in 2020, of course. Um, and the idea is to keep uh, advancing and adding more layers to our understanding of these associations, but also advancing and keeping it as a dynamic uh, resource. So we have uh, uh, ties with people, a lot of lo local scholars and minority scholars in the region uh, who have worked on this and they have deep familiarity. So for example, Ivan, you said that you already know from the Estonian case that things have changed and it makes sense, right? The war uh, must have affected how Russian speakers in Estonia, uh, you know, what kind of associations they engage in. And that is also in itself a very interesting research question that can be driven by this kind of data. Right? How has it affected it? Uh, and how um, something that comes to my mind is uh, which organizations in which uh, societal domains were most affected? Were those political associations, cultural, educational, uh, and so on? Something are probably uh, more politicized than others. Uh, so yes, the idea is to launch it uh, as with the data we have so uh, right now, but it's a work in progress. We want to uh, add more data and continue updating it. So the first task is just to continue updating it. That is all uh, 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 fund independent, uh, as you all know. Thank you. More questions from the room? Yeah. My name is Maria Chen, and I'm a professor in human and organizational learning here at George Washington University, and I'm a Hungarian from Romania. So, um, <laughs> as Jojo is uh, originally, <laughs> and um, uh, so I have just a comment on on the question that was said, and I have a question. Uh, I have many questions, but the comment is about crowdsourcing, and I was thinking of academic crowdsourcing. So how do you continuously collect data? Of course, it's nice to have a grant and you can get some grants, 
that maybe you can divide the universities that have programs, um, political science programs in their, uh, and they can use their students as projects. Uh, the students can participate in projects that are that have a very rigorous methodology, the same methodology, so to have a consistency. And I would call it academic crowdsourcing. But uh, it just came to mind mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. we are thinking of such an extensive mm -hmm. uh, database that has to be maintained continuously and is continuously changing. Mm -hmm. My question is about, uh, I'm, I'm also a quantitative and qualitative researcher, and I love to, uh, to know what's happening behind the numbers. Mm -hmm. so, participation. So it's wonderful to have all these, these organizations and it's such a great, great uh, database that you are developing. It's unique. It, it will have, I'm sure, a phenomenal impact on the way minorities in different countries will start to learn about how they participate, how what's happening in their own countries. But you know, I was thinking, oh, it's wonderful, you know, we have 9,477 Hungarian organizations in Romania, or different types, you know, at mm -hmm. different levels. How many people, how many, how, what is the percentage of the Hungarian population that are participating in these organizations? Because we can have them. We have a lot of policies, a lot of institutions, as you mentioned before, here in the United States and everywhere in the world. But the participation is, is crucial here. So I'm thinking about the phenomenal, as you were talking about the phenomenal opportunities for qualitative research that could, could uh, give us that data, um, that in-depth data. And the other thing I don't know if you have on your, on your, uh, on your database is a, a quick description of these countries because, for example, in Romania, Romania is a part of the European Union and European Union requires, it's a mandate, to have certain numbers of institutions that are dedicated to minority issues. So sometimes it's mandated, depending on which, which group you are part of, like the European Union, you know, you want it or not, you want to be part of the European Union, you better have that institution and that institution and that institution. So I was wondering, thank you so much for showing me. Uh, yes, yeah, so you have the description of the countries and if they are a member of a group that mandates certain policies related to minorities. Yeah. So, thank you so much. Very, you very thank you for your presentation, very thought provoking and very interesting. Thank you for the suggestion also for academic crowdsourcing. And there, we have been we have been doing some qualitative research as part of that uh, project, <laughs> essentially interviewing local scholars, mostly interviewing uh, leaders or executive members of key institutions in in the main institutional domains. And we've done that in all nine cases. So it's a lot of interviews that I only analyzed uh, using en vivo the six cases here, but um, three cases have not, those interviews have not yet been analyzed. But those are a wealth of information about um, you know what what organizations actually really do, mm -hmm. and that's where funding structure about each organization can also be detected. It requires a lot of resources, a lot of footwork, which is one reason why it's so difficult to do this comparatively. But we think it's very important because we are interested in democracy and multi-ethnic societies, and we are hoping and have already received some feedback about commitment from scholars across Europe. So if I can just add, uh, just to a question about participation, I, I guess we don't have time to address that. That's a great question. I just wanted to show here how this can be used as a resource. Uh, so we have, this is the, the 12 societal domains. So uh, just by clicking on each one, it shows um, <laughs> the subcategories we use uh, to categorize associations. So here, you know, when one thinks about associations, you know, this is quite uh, comprehensive. We have everything from archives and museums to theaters and film and photo organizations. Uh, and or even think of religion where churches so per, uh, and parishes. So participation will look different with the way people engage with different organizations, participate or become members of them 
varies across these domains and this, you know, they have different functions. Or, but that's a great question to answer, right? To ask and, and answer. So uh, how many people actually use what you were asking at the outset, right? How many Hungarians in Romania actually use these organizations? And, and uh, uh, yeah, so just uh, wanted to show that you can look at the subcategories to better understand what, it, you know, uh, to get a bit more content behind the numbers. I have a question online, but I will go to it in a minute. My name is Yaroslav Belinsky. I'm a research scholar here yes. in this earlier school. My question is, is it possible from your database to understand how the keen states, which are not very democratic, let's be honest, influence on the minority organizations in democratic states or vice versa? That's the one million dollar question. <laughs> uh, that's 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 the first and foremost, uh, you know, goal for our expansion uh, mm -hmm. is to ask exactly that. And what Juja was saying earlier, so we speak to their self-governing capacity within the associations, but how autonomous are they from other greater powers, uh, right? Their states or uh, keen states, and uh, if there are ties, what do they look like? Is it money? Is it uh, uh, networks uh, or some other uh, ways of you know communication? So that would greatly help us understand, right? The minorities themselves and state minority relations in general. There is a way of looking at kin states, even in an optimal situation as a double-edged sword, that it can be really helpful as cultural reinforcement, as also even reinforcement of the idea that this is a valuable culture to maintain. It's worth maintaining because there's a place where there is a state behind it, good theaters, lots of cultural, you know, a spectrum of opportunities that a minority population may not be able to maintain. But what if the king state becomes uh, authoritarian, has its own interest in capturing those minority institutions across the border? What happens then? And our primary interest is in democratic agency, in, in what makes people living in a minority condition invested in democracy, where they are. And so if their agency, if their capacity to have decision making decreases due to the kin state dependence, that's not good either. But how do you measure that? So we are working on how to develop that further. So that's part of the idea of developing this database further. I have another one by Hugh Agnew and then. So I'm Hugh Agnew, I'm a history professor here at GW, mm -hmm. virus. Um, and so I'm asking a question outside of your discipline, maybe in way out of left field, but, but I noticed that one of the categories you have is state supported institutions. I'm imagining nefariously that the state could support minority institutions in several ways. Like one could be here is money, do with it as you will. But one would be here is money if you do this. Mm -hmm. So sure. do you differentiate between these kinds of institutions supported by the state at all? Or is this you know, a level of granularity that we get to later on when you're doing the qualitative mm -hmm. type research? Yeah, so at this point, we don't uh, separate those because so the tension here is to you know, develop these categories that are analytically useful and distinctions, just like the one you're making right now. Okay, but the state can support them in different ways, right? Uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, to present something quite big that could apply to all associations. It could apply to schools, uh, to parishes, to uh, minority theaters and political parties, right? So then, so we went with this, the, the latter end of this, uh, uh, spectrum where we try to say something about any type of association uh, to you know better understand if it is controlled by the state in some capacity. So that's why we say uh, state controlled, right? That it, it can be through funding, it can be through some kind of infrastructure and other resources, it could be through decision making. Where even there, right, it can vary from uh, some kind of dictate as you suggested, or just having a few uh, members, uh, you know, civil servants sitting on the uh, committees that make decisions, right? So those are great questions, right? To then uh, zoom in on the state-sponsored one and, and say, okay, so uh, how well do they actually meet the needs of minorities uh, or not? Yeah, thank you.
We have online, Alexandra, are you listening? Kozio, question to unmute. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm Alexandra Kozio, I'm researcher, minority researcher from Poland. That is very inspiring what you presented right now. But I have one question with regards to methodology and specifically the time factor. Is it possible um, using this database to understand how the situation of minorities changes in time uh, with regards to these specific examples? Because just to just to use use one example, which is Russian uh, aggression on Ukraine and the situation in Central and Eastern Europe is changing rapidly because of that, especially uh, with regards to to minorities. And therefore, my question, if it is possible to to grasp this kind of change using your database. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's a, a great question. We, we keep coming back to Russia, and I think the, the takeaway here is that everything has changed. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, no database can keep up to date with such transformative events uh, that completely shattered, uh, you know, everyday life of people, uh, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, directly affected by it, but also sort of the ripple effects, right? Uh, uh, Ukrainian refugees everywhere and, uh, and Poland being the primary zone for where I imagine a lot of uh, changes on a societal level occurred and a lot of maybe different associations uh, ceased to exist, whereas uh, numerous others uh, uh, came to be. So the, I guess it would depend on the exact question one were to ask about uh, minority associations in Poland, but even if the database does not have the you know, sure numbers uh, to, uh, uh, to use for uh, speaking to minority association life in Poland, uh, it provides with the concepts. Right, that could be used, that could be applied to collect data and knowing what to look for. So to look at minority associations, to know uh, what kind of associations in which domain, what kind of form or uh, they, do they take on? Uh, what, is, what is their density? What can that tell us about what is going on, right? So there is a conceptual contribution here as well as the you know, database and just the numbers um, that it can provide. Following up on that, thank you, Alexandra, for being here. Um, great question. And you inspired me, your question inspired <laughs> me to do <laughs> a, a push for um, time series, at least two, the, two points in time, because this is before <laughs> the big transformative change, which in political science, we call a critical juncture. Critical juncture. <laughs> and life before a critical juncture and life after a critical juncture. And it would be actually pretty awesome to have a uh, repeat or mm -hmm. actually a better um, set of uh, a mapping of, of associations and what they do. Um, I don't know, two years from now and then see whether there is change because on the individual level, aggregate individual level data on educational you know, the quality question about PISA and educational attainment, all of that, um, we do have time series, which is quite a, kind of neat because that comes from available statistics. But this, we are actually doing something novel here. And so we have created a bit of a baseline <laughs> and then there can be <laughs> another mapping and then comparing what happens. So thank you. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we are working on. There Last time I heard about the project, I said the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Kadir from IRS. I'm Fulbright Visiting Scholar here. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we have discussed earlier about my project, and is um, I study on Uyghurs, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm asking the same question, but uh, without this knowledge. <laughs> And this uh, study, 
and I'm looking to influence. Mm -hmm. And like the Ukraine, and just I'm asking the same question to how Chinese mm -hmm. uh, pressure or Chinese human rights violation mm -hmm. in the region uh, influence the Uyghur minorities or the diaspora organizations, um, you know, ability to uh, access the decision making process in host countries. Uh, but just uh, I'm asking about your database or how can we generalize in this data? Is it a region or context um, dependent or uh, can we uh, just take this database um, and we can ex extend it to other contexts, for example, Africa in Latin America or other regions? And do you have this idea in your mind? We do have that idea in our oh. mind. So that's why we went to in the direction of creating a flexible comparative framework that includes all kinds of institutions, organ, I mean, ins institutional domains and then organizations within those institutional domains from politics to, I don't know, sports through media and education and everything, right? Because we think that the minority condition is universal in the sense that there are minorities in nation building states, persistent minorities, but it's also always specific to each case, depending on numbers and where they live and the time, historicity and status, right? And so the framework is, 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 uh, is really flexible and we think it's usable in all kinds of other cases, other situations. And we also think that, that the data speaks to some, this is what comparative is good for, speaks to, the, to some common trends and patterns. And if you look at the types of domains that are heavily populated, <coughs> education is definitely going to be one, uh, depending on what the special interest is, what the glue is, what the boundary maker is, the ethnic boundary maker is whatever is, if it's language, if it's religion, if it's birth, if it's something else, those cultural institutions are probably likely to be bonding institutions and, and uh, populated. Those fields are gonna be more populated, but it's still an interesting question whether people tend to maintain minority governed or shared institutions or how, is, how, does, this, how does this work? So we think that these categories are transferable to other regions and then we are looking forward to see how that how that plays out so yeah yeah i am chandra shuba former world bank and my last job in the world bank was in big building and maintaining partnerships and i just wanted to ask you uh, did you or ryan Tuja, think about funding uh, and the interest of the funders because what I found out in my, uh, and this later part of my career, is that uh, funding rarely happens out of charity, out of self-interest, uh, and or lack of self-interest. And uh, what I found to be most bonding and long-standing uh, driver of funding and partnerships is leverage. If what you do provides leverage for others to do achieve what they want to achieve and when they feel that their resources for one reason or the other maybe because of not enough money or in your case probably because of not having the, the substantive knowledge what you have and can generate more of it with this database because yes you could build on the power of pooling with the like-minded all academic institutions we all want to know these things we have a little bit of research budget let's put it together if it is just a little bit of metadata pulling together, it could work. But if you need to generate the kind of things you all mentioned, like a $1 million, it may cost more than $1 million. So in order to, to, to gather the, the funders and the partners, you need to find uh, the, the points of leverage. Mm -hmm. And I could see that, you know, the you communists, you know, the value of the lesser, uh, less whatever. Um, I mean, obviously there are a lot of institutions and funders who are more interested in the macro, mm -hmm. how to make policies, and on the micro, what I could frame as outcomes. Outcomes which are dependent on the macro 
decisions, policy frameworks, and working on the institutions, the meso level we want to capture. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there's a lot of resources aligned with focusing on those the outcomes at the micro. If you can ignite their interest, you might gather them on your side as funders mm -hmm. and as partners. So this is a question and comment. The question is, and you thought about it, how do you want to market yourself? Mm -hmm. That's a great question and comment. Mm -hmm. um, so as you can see, there is quite a range, right, of the organizations, whether they're nonprofit or not. and um well first of all uh, what's interesting is that when you think of minority associations uh especially when we talk about minority democratic agency the first thing that comes to mind is a uh, non-profit right uh organizations run by minorities and maybe even centrally governed minority association sounds like an oxymoron right so speaking to what uh, you to your comment uh, earlier uh or for profit how does a for-profit organization sort of maintain that glue within minority community uh, but this way we can uh, see the entire range and then exactly spark questions like that uh, uh, as to how this funding is generated. And just from anecdotal experience in the Baltic cases, uh, oftentimes states do not want to provide uh, certain uh, services or commit to continuous funding, but organizations need this time horizon, right? This uh, commitment to funding so they can uh, uh, maintain their activity. So they start pulling out and what they do instead at times, for example, Estonia did that, I think also Latvia, they provide training to minority, to chairs of organizations on how to apply to European funds. So they uh, present sort of, uh, you know, as a, as a menu, uh, available sources of funding. Uh, they uh, do brief uh, training sessions on how to write a grant application. First, where to find that information, how to write it, and, and, and really train them on that. And uh, that's another thing that, you know, you learn through projects like this, that it's not necessarily auto, like generated by minority members or just given by the state. There are all these other ways uh, uh, leveraging what association does and maybe its contribution to the minority or society at large even, uh, as a theater could do, right? Uh, but also to know that the state can provide that kind of training so the minority can be better at, uh, um, uh, well, applying for external grants, European uh, grants, for example. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, there are all these ways to generate that uh, um, financial security. I don't have anything online, but yeah. I, you know, it's mesmerizing for me and we put it on the table here. We are, most of us, we are doing academic research as in it's phenomenal. And here we are talking about a combination of academic research and putting what we are studying on the market. Mm -hmm. And that requires completely different skills. Mm -hmm. so what Shandor asked here was, uh, as I understood the question, and that was if you, you gave a very interesting answer, but how do you get to understand what are the interests of those people who give the millions of dollars for a continuous project like this in order to leverage oh, what you are doing? Mm -hmm. oh, so in order to do that, you need completely different skills that we are trained for most of us. Mm -hmm. Or even if we are, we are knowledgeable because, you know, we are whatever, uh, doesn't matter. We are knowledgeable about that. We don't have the time. Because mm -hmm. either you dedicate your time to develop a rigorous research and, and develop a database like this, or you put you need 100% of a, somebody's time to go around and go to the different agencies and different big mm -hmm. uh, funding uh, sources uh, to see what, can, what are they interested in. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share this because it's always when uh, and at, at GW now here, we have a lot of uh, a lot of you know um, incentives to put our products on the research products on the market, you know. Yeah. And we have institutes mm -hmm. now that here at the university that uh, try to partner with us researchers. So I was thinking how uh, how you could think of having a partner who <laughs> does that like work. With no strings of course. No <laughs> <laughs> and course, on that note, we probably the political part is another thing. Yeah. 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 Yes. I mean, ideal. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if it's possible. 
Adam, can I put you on the spot to yes, ask something? <laughs> you want to say something? Um, yeah. Or ask? Yeah, I mean, this is really fantastic. And I think because your work on Supernash, I mean, let yeah. me preface yeah. this. He's finishing a dissertation that I'm on his committee, so I'm going to put him on the spot. That's why I can do that. Yeah. Um, on subnationalism in Russia, in the Russian Federation. So, in a way, some of this could be seen um, transferable at that level yeah. within yeah. the Russian Federation. So, I'm, I'm possibly I'm right, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's one of the things I was thinking of with the paper and the presentation was how it could transfer outside of the cases mm -hmm. you mentioned. And I know that you'd said you're looking at the Balkans and I guess one of my questions was really you know, I know you've got a European Union grant so it seems naturally that other European countries are a, a suitable way to extend um I think it can also extend to you know authoritarian contexts as well more right. in ways right. it can um I guess the question I had and it's related to a couple of others is that I suppose when you have regimes that are I guess in terms of center act looks you know regimes of ethnicity you have the anti-ethnic regimes um, and I just wondered, you know, in your experience coming up with this database, like to what extent did you have uh, you know, times when it was quite hard to find the data or did you have to work around a lot of the time? Because like, it seems like a lot of you know, some of the governments here were maybe helpful in providing information, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe you know, that wasn't the case all the time. So I'm just curious how, because I think for looking at, say, the Russian context, that would be a big challenge to, yeah. to mm -hmm. try and find some of this information. I, mean, I think there are workarounds, yeah. but um i'm looking to yeah and, and i think in terms of the funding i mean i'm sure if you're looking at kin state activities i mean i, I don't know i'm sure there's organizations in in washington that would be very interested in i don't know, you know sort of military things like that which mm -hmm. have russian influence but um yeah i'm just curious how you sort of worked around the issue of dealing with gatekeepers um, yeah that's a great question mm -hmm. yeah um it, it's a great question. It came up on both the micro level and the meso level as, you know, to find comparable data is really challenging. Uh, some countries do not put out information that is uh, for income or uh, education that's broken down by ethnicity. They do it by nationality, so whether you're a citizen or not, right? And that there's no necessarily overlap. A lot of minorities might be citizens, but actually, you know, distinct, they're minorities. So that is uh, one uh, challenge to overcome for Russian speakers in uh, the Baltics. Another challenge was that sometimes they're referred to even in uh, official statistics as Russians, and then it's broken down by Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, you know, and all the other Jews, satyrs. Uh, but in other contexts, the data is presented uh, uh, that speaks to all Russian speakers. So we know the composition of the Russian speaking minority uh, in these countries uh, in terms of ethnicity, but it is still not the same data, right? So you're still comparing kind of data that is on uh, slightly different levels. And at the meso level, as you were saying, the gatekeepers, yes, were really important, especially in domains where uh, we didn't have a neat uh, list of organizations that you were just handed. So if you think of schools, uh, most of that is, um, uh, you know, there are registered schools and it's uh, available data that it was relatively easy to find. But in some domains, it was very difficult to uh, to identify minority organizations in cultural domain, for example, or other domains where they're not listed in any official uh, website or you know, resource, and there is no one uh, to speak to who knows the complete picture in that societal domain, or do not want to speak to specifically minority associations. Well, I think after seeing this presentation, it might be intuitive to think of minority associations, but uh, when you know, uh, when you think in general as uh, of the population of the city or the country, uh, these distinctions do not just exist out there, uh, and uh, majority members uh, sometimes do not want to make these distinctions and you know provide that data. I have a question online. If that's if sure. you don't want to. Sure. So Hillary, Hillary yeah. Silver, do you want to? Hi. Hi. I'd like to ask a question, please. Um, so I heard somebody asked a question about the Uyghurs. So I want to uh, ask you about India. Um, so I've been studying Indian uh, minorities. And, um, you know, th some of the things that happens is you have, you have recognition of what they call communities in the constitutional order there. Um, and sometimes what, what happens is that people 
for uh, the, just to give an example, of course, the Muslims um, are a recognized group, um, a recognized minority, but they're assigned particular functions through the law. So family law, for example, is governed by religion, um, which creates problems for women, for example, if they want to get divorced um, outside of Sharia law, then they have this problem that there's nowhere to go. Um, so I'm wondering to what extent you've, uh, so there, that, that was one question. So what do you do about the, the legal boundaries that confine people to their minority identities rather than, uh, rather than allow them to become full citizens in a sense across uh, domains? And the second question I had is something that I guess, I don't know if it, it's a problem in uh, Eastern Europe or not, but um, tribal, uh, tribal minorities or indigenous minorities get a great deal of attention. Well, we have tribes in India, but they're also indigenous peoples um, in uh, the Arctic, for example, and in Latin America that um, have a very sort of are treated legally as a special minority status, separate from the kinds of um, uh, linguistic and religious minorities that you're talking about, um, th that they have almost, they're assigned almost complete autonomy um, within the state. So I was wondering if you could just, if, are you addressing those two or did I just, I came late, so I'm not sure <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's so inspiring to see people from other contexts yes. saying, uh, asking questions uh, and, you know, uh, kind of asking about these concepts and trying to stretch them and see if they apply to their research. So that's already great. Um, so I think it goes back to the question by Adam on uh, Shaniraq Turk's work uh, in terms of, in our cases, I don't think we've encountered minorities that are prohibited to um, exhibit their ethnicity or different uh, identity in some way and to organize around, you know, collective interests uh, that are banned, like anti-ethnic regimes, what he calls, uh, or uh, minorities that, uh, again, are not uh, allowed, are not recognized. So there might be some minorities that are recognized, uh, but if you are not a recognized minority, you're kind of, you kind of don't exist. And there are certainly cases like that, mostly in uh, uh, non-democracy. So um, I don't know that I have a, an answer to that, not even a good answer, uh, but in our cases, um, we didn't face any situations where in some domains, minority uh, organizations were uh, banned if they were on the basis of their distinct identity. Uh, but uh, thinking about expanding it further, that's definitely something to keep in mind, right? As, as data comes in, if we're dealing in some non-democracies, especially where uh, lack of data might mean something, right? It's not just the lack of data, but actually it's meaningful it uh, for uh, their association life and opportunities available to them. And that also, uh, thank you for that question. That is also inspiring in a, in a way for us to think about how we should, uh, describe what's called the scope conditions of our, mm -hmm. of our project to make sure that we can define it because obviously it doesn't cover the whole entire universe of uh, minorities, but we are focusing on minorities in majoritarian nation building states. And what um, Adam pointed out is that Yes, the framework and the categories are applicable to non-democracies, but research is extremely difficult in non-democracies because the whole notion of minority democratic agency or democratic anything, right, <laughs> <laughs> is, is a problem. So the whole, the premise of all this and the whole idea of, of creating social resilience, society's resilience can be a problem if someone wants to build a dictatorship. I grew up under one, under Chaușescu's dictatorship. Uh, you don't see associations because, because, because they're not allowed to exist. So research on it is, is much more difficult. So that, that is a problem. We're almost at time. So I think it's best if we give you the last two, three minutes, if you want to say something overall or. 
Just yes. advertise the website. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, please check out the website. We try to present. The website is built um, as to exhibit the different uh, sort of uh, sides of the database. So, and that is to spark questions. So to present different types of data so that the kind of questions you've asked us kind of come up, right? Different slices of information on individual, on meso level, by domain, by country, by minority, uh, by form, by what everything. So we have uh, visualizations here. Uh, we have summary cases uh, to look. So that's questions about education or politics or whatever come to mind. Uh, yeah, please take a look at the database. We are working on uh, also being able to download big chunks or even the master uh, data set. We just want to make sure everything is polished and usable. Um, and uh, so we are happy yeah. to do this service, <laughs> <laughs> but we are also hoping that that it will be supported. That what. Um, Chandra Shikosh said that there, there is a way, there's, it's not coincidental that much of the research is on the end knowledge, therefore, is about the macro level <laughs> and the individual level, and there isn't enough on the meso level, which is so important for democracy. Everyone recognizes it. And uh, so there has to be a way for us as well to, to create that interest and <laughs> leverage so that it can be supported and, and maintained. Because wherever we spoke about it, people saw the value of it, but it's labor intensive. And um, we, have to we have to keep highlighting the relevance and significance for a piece for, <laughs> for all kinds of uh, common goods, shared interests. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.